Hello, my name is Tariq Mahmood, and I welcome you to our first uh, program, The Point, where in the coming days and uh, coming weeks and months, we hope to discuss a variety of issues. We start today with a discussion around the unfolding events of Kashmir, but our focus is not going to be a news discussion, but more on trying to draw out the similarities between the situation of Palestine and the Palestinians and the situation of Kashmir and the Kashmiris and how two major ideologies, the ideology of Zionism and the ideology of Hindutva affect the political and social dynamic that unfolds in front of us. For those of you who don't know perhaps where Kashmir is, it is the butterfly shape that sits on top of in uh, the map of South Asia and China, where to one side is Pakistan, to another side is India, at the top is China. And as you may well know, this butterfly is being well trampled by forces of uh, uh, many forces that are affecting it. My guest today is Rania Masri. Thank you very much, Rania, for coming along. A pleasure Rania, to be with you. A pleasure to be with you. Rania is a long-term friend, and she is also an environmental activist and a boycott activist, and also has participated in a variety of political actions and continues to be very politically active in Lebanon. I come to you from Beirut today. Rania is in America. And we are talking to you on JKTV Live. Rania, perhaps for those of us who don't know, mm -hmm. that in a way, the ideas that are taking place within Kashmir, perhaps you are not as well aware, but many Kashmiris are saying that India has gone for a, an Israeli type of mm -hmm. a situation. Mm -hmm. This is at the same time when India is described as the biggest democracy in the world. And we have a similar situation, if you like, in, in uh, the Middle East, where Israel is described as the only democracy yeah. in the Middle East. Perhaps you could explain to our viewers what, what do you say to that statement? Um, well, hello again to you all. And, and thank you for inviting me to your show and for this discussion. I think when we talk about democracy, we need to take a step back and define it. I mean, what is democracy? If democracy is the rule of the few over the many, then one can argue, yes, that Israel is a democracy. If democracy is based on an occupying force, making laws that support its own occupation and ignoring the needs and equality of the majority of the people in the land, then yes, Israel is the democracy and definitely the only democracy in the region because they are the only settler state occupation in the region. But if we're going to recognize what democracy really is, and one of the clearest tenets of democracy is equality. No way could we argue that we have a democratic state when that state's institutionalized laws are not based on equality. So we, we need to examine then, is there equality within the so-called state of Israel? Is there equality within Israeli laws? Is there equality within even the philosophy of Zionism? And the clear answer to that, and this is not an opinion, it's a legal answer, is no. There is no equality by Israeli laws against the occupied Palestinian people within the so-called state of Israel, nor is there equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel itself. So if we examine that, then clearly Israel is not a democracy. It is by definition, a settler state occupy, occupation. That really brings us in a way very neatly to the situation also in South Asia, that that which is happening under occupation can't really have any legal validity exactly. until the people that are occupied have some sort of say in the meaning of their lives, let alone mm -hmm. the political direction. Yes. But one of the things perhaps we could move on to, you mentioned the word Zionism. And here, as you know, in the, 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 the BJP-led government is being described as an Hindutva, an, a, an organization that bases its ideology 
on Hindutva, on simply put Hindu Rashtra, Hindu rule, to what extent, and there are, if as you are well aware, uh, conferences going on in uh, India this coming few days, were sponsored by the Israeli embassy there on the similarities between Hindutva and Zionism. To what extent would you be, could you explain to those of us who don't know what Zionism is? And also, if those of us who oppose Hindutva are being accused of being anti-Hindu, that which we certainly are not. And similarly, is it that opposition to Zionism is also opposition to uh, Judaism? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's let's take it one step at a time. So what is Zionism? And if we look at the way that the Zionists themselves define it, the Zionists themselves define Zionism as a Jewish nationalist movement whose goal is the creation and support of a Jewish national state in Palestine. Okay, so let, let's break that down. So here we have one clear uh, breakdown, which is the religion, Judaism, is defined and regarded as a nationality or an ethnicity. Okay, so if we were going to say that uh, we want to have a Christian nationalist movement where we regard Christianity as a nationality, we can immediately see the problems that, that would arise as a consequence. Because the moment that one defines one's intimate relationship with God as one's nationality or ethnicity, we can see where this will go. You know, we are, we are automatically creating laws that would support inequality. So here we have one definition, one clear breakdown of Zionism. We have another breakdown of Zionism, which is again, as the Zionists define it, supporting a Jewish national state in Palestine, which means therefore to support a settler state occupation that would be founded based on ethnic cleansing. Okay, so this is their definition. And when we regard Zionism very clearly as it is, a settler state occupation built on ethnic cleansing and built on the concept of one community, in this case, a Jewish community, having superiority over other communities. When we identify it as it is, we also see that Zionism is nothing exceptional in our human history. It is part and, uh, and, and it is an intricate part of the larger project of colonialism, very simply. So let's take it even a step forward. There's a new book that has just been released by an Israeli sociologist, and the book is entitled War Over Peace. And in this book, um, the sociologist actually examines Zionist ideology, and he argues that war and violence are embedded within this ideology. And if we are to remember that this, this state of Israel was created through the brutal displacement of almost 800,000 Palestinians and the destruction, the deliberate destruction of more than 500 Palestinian towns and villages, then it becomes natural to understand how this ideology cannot but be embedded within war and violence. So its core components of Zionism, again, according to this Israeli sociologist, the core components of Zionism are ethno-nationalism, where again, we have a nationalist idea built on what he defines as an ethnicity, but what I prefer to regard simply as a religion, and militarism, ethno-nationalism and militarism, okay, de de designed to have political and economic control over a people and over a land that is not theirs. We see the same thing in the creation of the United States by the settler colonials that came here, in the um, you know, occupation of Australia by the settler colonialists that went to Australia. We see it repeated over and over again in our history. And at, at the same time, we see the repetition of people fighting for their liberty in opposition to these settler colonialist projects. So this is what Zionism is. Now, if we are going to, to say that to be anti-Zionist would be anti-Jewish, then that is basically saying that the people have to accept their oppressor or they will be accused of racism. And it also is ahistoric. And this becomes really, really important for us to understand. Some of the key individuals that supported the Zionist movement were themselves vehement anti-Semites, vehement anti-Semites. Take one of the most famous characters who was Lord Balfour. Lord Balfour in 1917 came up with this idea of giving something that's not his, which is Palestine, <laughs> to the Jews. Okay, now let's give them this land. And he didn't do this because he believed in the concept of a Jewish state. He did it because he did not want Jews to live amongst him in England. 
And again, this is not simply my perspective. These are real historians that have identified that Lord Balfour himself was one of the most vile racist. I mean, at that time, they were all quite racist. But not only that, but that he pushed for uh, restrictions against Jewish immigration into Great Britain during the time that there were pogroms attacking Jews throughout a lot of Europe. So at the time that there was be these Jews, you know, coming from parts of Europe where they're facing pogroms, particularly in Poland and others, and they want to seek refuge within Great Britain, this is when Prime Minister Balfour in 1905 decided to pass a law called the Aliens Act that had the first restrictions on immigration into Great Britain designed to restrict Jewish immigration. So his idea was we'll get rid of the Jews because we don't see them as English and we'll throw them into Palestine. Okay? Ironically, or most importantly, one could argue that one of the loudest voices against the Balfour Declaration was himself a Jew and the only Jewish member of the cabinet. Edwin Samuel Montague, who was the only Jewish member of the cabinet, spoke forcefully against the Balfour Declaration and he said, and I quote, I wish to place on record my view that the policy of His Majesty's government is anti-Semitic and will prove a rallying ground for anti-Semites in every country in the world. So here we have that the cry against the Balfour Declaration, which whose aim was to give Palestine to the Jews, the cry against it was that this declaration is anti-Semitic. So again, this idea that if one condemn Zionism, one is regarded as anti-Semitic, I would argue, is in and of itself <laughs> anti-Semitic. The very concept that we mix a political ideology with a religious group and we say that any criticism of that political ideology becomes a criticism of the religious group is in and of itself an offense against that religious group. It's, it's very true. I was thinking as you were talking a little bit back to the role of religion within South Asia as you, pro as you know, that Pakistan itself was created in, uh, on a notion that there were two nations, the two nation theory, and in a sense that Muslims and Hindus were two separate nations. With the creation of Bangladesh, that got dismissed out into the dustbin of history. And what the Hindutva movement is now pushing in a, in a very large number, having won the elections within India, and also, as you, your uh, viewers, uh, your, your our viewers may well know, that it has unleashed in itself within India many a horror, which we hope to discuss in time to come. Even as we talk, some of the feeds and comments coming on mm -hmm. are very clearly anti-Hindu, and we want to stress here that under no circumstances mm -hmm. is anything that we are discussing here uh, either anti-Semitic or anti-Hindu, but a clear-cut. Uh, opposition to those who would equate politics with a religion and ram that down on other people's throats. Yeah. Some of the comments coming here are that, you know, Kashmir, a free Kashmir is a dream. Okay. I have heard the same comments. Free Palestine is a dream. Get real. Accept the reality of colonialism. Accept the reality that Israel is here to stay that settlements are here to stay. To those who would push that sort of a line, what do you say? I think that they have not read their own history. Every movement in human history has believed in dreaming. When we looked at the abolition of slavery in the United States, where slavery officially came into existence in the United States 400 years ago, I believe that the abolitionists that were fighting against slavery believed in the dream of freedom. Were we to have gone back in time, should we have told them, no, you should accept the reality of slavery and get used to the whips being thrown against your back and get used to your children being torn from your, your arms? Is that what we should have told the slaves in the United States hundreds of years ago? I mean, the concept of working for workers' rights, for example, and fighting for the right for, for fair wages, should we also tell those that are struggling in sweatshops throughout the country, throughout the world, that no, you should accept your plight and simply bow down to your oppressor. I find that those that reject the belief in dreaming, the reality of fighting for freedom, that those that reject that tend to themselves side with the oppressor. And we reject it because of our belief in human history. And no, we, yes, we believe in dreaming. And yes, I believe in the dream of a free Palestine. And I believe in working valiantly to make that dream into reality. 
because this reality that we are living in today, this concept that you can have Israelis supported by the United States and the United Kingdom and the Indian government go into Palestinian homes, throw them out from their homes, take their children into jails, continue to kill them without, without any regard, to kill them with impunity. And we should simply look and say to the Palestinians, die silently? Is that the cry of those who reject the concept and the belief in freedom that we should die silently? Is that the alternative they are giving us? No, clearly not. History shows us that those who believe in dreaming are the only people who have actually provided something that we should be proud of in this world. So no, we believe in dreaming and we will work together to liberate our lands and our people from the yokes of oppression. It's very true, Rania, because if we don't believe in dreams, then we have to accept that we live in a nightmare. And yes. what sort of life is there of living inside yeah. a nightmare? Yes, yes. In a way, if we can move a little bit out, just like Palestine is has a huge regional implication mm -hmm. of what goes on in Palestine, you know, we can see the wars that, in a sense, the Israeli uh, regime does not recognize any international rights, laws, or anything like that. And we have been pushed into a similar situation. And for our viewers, so that they don't confuse that we are on an anti-Indian tirade, we believe, in a way, I firmly believe that the solution to Kashmir lies not in India, not in Pakistan, but give, and also India and Pakistan are both oppressors. Yes. They have both denied the people of Kashmir their rights. And the solution lies in uh, giving the right of self-determination to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And actually, Rania, just on a side mm -hmm. thing, these countries, India and Pakistan, considering we are 1.6 billion or so, uh, people on the planet are turning into uh, open air prisons yes. with all sorts of horrors taking place under the many different guises. Now, one of the uh, uh, re things I would like to draw another parallel is that what goes on in Palestine has a direct impact yes. on the region, and what goes on in Kashmir has a direct not only region but global. We have a million soldiers on the Indian side. We probably have the same sorts of numbers on the Pakistani side, the most militarized zone on the planet, and yet they send more soldiers in. And you can see that the forces of the night, as we started talking of dreams, the forces of night are bringing about an agenda of some form of ethnic cleansing. So I'd like you your comments, if you can. Yeah. What sort of regional implications the non-resolution of the Palestinian issue can have. And from that, our Kashmiri friends and friends in South Asia can draw their own lessons to how it affects us as well. That's a huge question. <laughs> I mean, immediately I would think of two layers. So you have one layer, which is the layer of oppression and the way that the oppressor continues to um, invest in oppression locally, regionally, and internationally. And you have on the other layer, the layer of resistance and the way that resistance can spread like the fires that we believe in, not like the capitalistic fires in the Amazon right now, but like the fires of birth. So those two layers, and I think it's important to examine them within those two layers. Now, when you look at Israel currently, okay, Israel is one of the world's largest exporters of weapons and one of the world's largest exporters, not only of weapons, but of militaristic tactics and oppression itself. It also has a very clear political line, I mean, very clear, since the 1950s, of wanting to transform the entire Middle East, which, by the way, as a side note, is a term I completely abhor, and I really don't like using it, but that's a side note. I'm sorry, I don't like using it. Yes, we but we, but we, ha we have evidence and we have statements from Israeli prime ministers and Israeli sociologists, et cetera, et cetera, that show us that from the 1950s, the plan of the Israeli government has been not only to subjugate the Palestinian people through ethnic cleansing and home demolitions and apartheid, but also to spread their sphere of influence throughout the region. Okay? So we have seen that their plan has been to push for sectarian statelets, smaller states throughout the region within Iraq, to divide Iraq into Kurds, Sunnis and Shias, to divide Syria, to divide Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen it in that region and that plan is ongoing. We have also seen a very intimate relationship between the apartheid Israeli regime and 
the political apartheid regime of South Africa. Okay, we have seen also a, a close relationship between the Israeli regimes and problematic regimes throughout Africa and Central America. So we see that this policy, this this idea of of oppression and of subversion and of apartheid will need by design to create other oppressors and to support other oppressors. So it would have a raison d'être to exist. And that idea, this, this, this oppression of, you know, th this oppressor mentality of Israel cannot be separated from its racist ideology. So it will promote racism wherever it goes and it will promote sectarian divide wherever it goes. Therefore, we see it becomes a natural ally to this problematic Indian government that we have right now. It becomes a natural ally because they both have the same philosophy. And we can talk about all of these things that I stated in a lot more detail if you want. But on the other hand, we also have the hope that comes from resistance and the hope that comes from solidarity and of recognizing that we as oppressed populations need to not only liberate ourselves through our actions, liberate ourselves through our thinking, but also recognize that our liberation is not an exception, that we are not the only ones that have been oppressed and we are not the only ones that are currently oppressed. So how can we learn from each other's struggles? How can we build links with other communities and other people that are also facing similar struggles? How do we understand that we, as, as Palestinians who are being oppressed, have a long similarity with the indigenous communities throughout the Americas that are continuing to be oppressed and subjugated within Canada and the United States? What are the similarities in our struggle with their struggle? What are the similarities in our struggle with people of color throughout the United States and the United Kingdom that continue to face police brutality and racist laws and racist regards? How do we link those struggles? And now what are the similarities between our struggle and the, str the struggle of the people in Kashmir? for liberation, for recognition, and for hope. I think this is uh, so important. And uh, just to clarify, I really can't stand the idea of the Middle East. <laughs> we live at the tip of West Asia, and if yeah. you're watching it from this from Kashmir, Middle East will be somewhere else, not here. But let's leave that as a legacy that's gone by. Uh, just as uh, we should, uh, the resistance needs to learn, in a way, if the Hindutva and Zionist forces are very clearly unifying. So too, it would appear from what you've said and what a lot of people believe. So must the anti-Zionist and anti-Hindutva forces, not just in South Asia, but across uh, the world, need to learn and unite uh, to each other. You mentioned the relationships that are being built by these uh, really monstrous regimes across the world with Israel and uh, over the years. now. Could you give me a little bit, perhaps I read some figures that Israel supplies round about 20% of uh, India's defense uh, needs. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could talk about the Israeli oppression of the Palestinians a little bit more in detail and why Israeli weaponry is being mm -hmm. sold and has become popular as a means used by repressive regimes. Yes. Well, there's a, a brilliant report done by a journalist and a dear friend of mine, uh, Rania Kalik, in which she examined the reasons that Israel has become one of the main exporters of weapons in the world. So I'm quoting her here in, in what I'm saying. Um, we see that Israeli arms sales have increased dramatically in the past 15 years, from $2 billion a year to $9 billion a year. And what makes their weapons, the Israeli weapons, so seductive to other uh, oppressive governments around the world is that Israel can claim that their weapons have been battlefield tested, battlefield proven, okay? So they have tested these new weapons. Now, who are they testing their weapons on? They're testing their weapons on Palestinians, predominantly on the besieged Palestinians in Gaza. So in Gaza, you have people that are trapped in an open air prison, you know, trapped completely by air, by sea, by land, and we need to recognize that the vast majority of the Palestinians in Gaza are refugees from 1948. And the whole reason that they're not allowed to return to their homes in what is now called the State of Israel, but what we prefer to call Palestinian lands of 1948, the whole reason they're not allowed to go back to their homes is not because there's no space for them, not because their villages have been rebuilt by Israeli Zionist forces, but simply because they're not Jews. That's the only reason they're not allowed back again, which is the definition of apartheid, of racism, of oppression by design. 
but let's go back. So you have these testing grounds that the Israelis are forcing on the Palestinians, okay? They test them in Gaza and they also test them in the occupied West Bank, okay? Because of these testing grounds, Israel now has become the number one exporter of drone technology. They supply 60% of the world's drones to at least 50 different countries. And they were able to increase their export of these drones, particularly after the horrific 2014 attacks on Gaza, in which more than 2,200 Palestinians were killed in the 51-day massacre of Palestinians by the Israeli forces in 2014. Less than a month after their massacre, Israel held its annual drone expo and Elbit Systems, which is Israeli's largest military technology firm, continue to advertise that their weapons have been battlefield proven. Okay, so we, we've seen this, but we also have another kind uh, of horror that the Israelis are imposing, which is their border technology, their so-called border technology. Okay? And here, through the criminal, and again, I say this specifically, the criminal apartheid wall that Israel has built on the occupied lands and the, and the West Bank, they are able to take these surveillance technologies that they have learned by experience in their oppression and sell them worldwide. And as a consequence, they won a $145 million contract again in 2014 to build a border of surveillance tower technology along the Arizona-Mexico border. So we have two kinds of oppressive forces that the Israelis are exporting. One is their weapons and one is their surveillance and racist so-called surveillance technology. They're also building alliances with every police agency in the United States. And it would be important to understand if they're building these alliances, these so-called trainings with policing agencies in the United Kingdom, with policing agencies in India, where they export their racist perspective and their destructive weapons. I think you you know it's it's you really made me feel get goosebumps when I, we were talking of how the blood of Palestinians really because we have all watched in Gaza the constant bombardment that takes place but each of those bombardments this is battle testing it's the breaking of limbs it's the killing of people and in a sense that is going on also earlier on you referred to ethnic cleansing and one of the issues that confronts us and people, I don't mean only Kashmiris or South Asians, but all those who oppose ethnic cleansing and want some sort of a just order. One of the issues that confronts us is how do we learn from each other? The forces of reactionary reaction, Hindutva and Zionism, and some of the other guises that they have come out in, whether it be ISIS or other such equivalents, yes. These forces have also given an opportunity to us to begin to learn from each other. Now, many of our Kashmiri friends are really beaten down by 70 years of repression, by intense militarization. And whilst it is similar, it is not the same as Palestine, as you well know. So perhaps we could discuss a little bit more on resistance to occupation how since i know it's a big question you can choose whichever part of it the palestinian resents resistance has changed in many ways shapes and forms since the early militarized occupation of palestine and one of the things i'd like kashmiri uh, and, and and south asian viewers to understand that every inch of palestine was militarily conquered not just a little bit here and there so palestinian resistance has taken many different forms it has been military, it has been political. What would you describe as the waves of those repressions and the changes that went on with a particular reference to today of how difficult, disparate, and perhaps even desperate uh, it has become? <sighs> Another big question. Um, I mean, resistance against the uh, settler occupation in, in Palestine began before the State of Israel was created in 1948. Um, you know, the, there were labor strikes, there were um, also armed resistance against the occupation forces because the occupation before the Israelis came was British, let us remember. You know, the, the, the British had occupied Palestine and they were the ones that, that decided to give a land that's not theirs to a people that they didn't like. 
but let, let's go back. So we've had years of oppression. We also have had 70 years of oppression and occupation in Palestine. And we can have several big timelines. Um, so the occupation in 1948, what we regard as the Nakba or the catastrophe, where the vast majority of Palestinians were forced out of their homes at gunpoint, and we had the massive destruction of, of, of Palestinian towns and villages. We had the Nakba in 1967 with the occupation of the remaining lands of Palestine by the Zionist forces. These are the two um, periods that people typically refer to, but I think there's a third uh, act of catastrophe which is the signing of the Oslo Accords. And the reason I'm stating that is because it is, it, it's important for us to recognize it when we look at resistance. So the signing of the Oslo Accords was this presentation that we are willing to negotiate with our oppressor and our occupier, and that part of that negotiation would include a security coordination with our occupier, where it becomes our responsibility as the occupied to protect the security of the occupier himself, which is completely absurd, but that was part and parcel of the Oslo Accords. And the Oslo Accords contributed to the um, removal of the Arab boycott against Israel. And we had um, the revelation that a lot of the Arab governments, not the Arab peoples, but a lot of the Arab governments had always been in alliance with the Israeli state and with the Zionist philosophy. And as we see now with this open forms of collaboration between Saudi Arabia and their allies and their allies um, in the Israeli apartheid regime. But when we go back and we look at the Oslo Accords as being one primary act of defeat in our struggle for liberation, we understand what becomes a primary tenant for liberation which is the narrative itself. And liberation and resistance begins with understanding the narrative. Who are we and what do we want? Do we want to accept the crumbs from the tables of our occupier? Do we want to accept simply having the knives in our back pulled back a few inches rather than a complete removal of the knife? If that is what we want, then we would sit at the table with our occupier and decide exactly the degrees of indignity that we will suffer. If what we want is real liberation, real liberation, real national liberation, okay, then we would understand that we cannot be collaborating with our enemy as a means for our liberation. And consequently, the means for the liberation, again, they're tried and practiced throughout history. Part and parcel of liberation is armed resistance. And we have been pushed by liberal philosophers in this time period to condemn armed resistance, but I refuse to condemn armed resistance against an occupier. We have the legal, the moral, and the intrinsic right to resist an occupation with any means possible. So armed resistance becomes integral to that resistance. Another part of that resistance is boycott. And again, boycott is nothing really new historically. Boycott has been very old and it's been practiced by communities in Ireland, for example, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and of course in South Africa, and of course in India. And we see it being practiced in Palestine right now. We see it as one of the largest international movements of solidarity with the Palestinians, which is the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. So basically I see three, three pillars here claiming and understanding our narrative and using it forcefully, understanding the need for armed resistance, whether or not we are pacifist or not, and working with the boycott movement, be it nationally, regionally, or internationally. These are the three pillars. Once we understand these, then we are able to build links of solidarity, links, not charity, but links of solidarity with other communities facing oppression, facing racism, facing occupation. I think it's uh, you, you've you've summed it up very well, and I'd like to sort of take it a, a little bit further, especially on the point of the narrative. Let me say firstly, I think that there is no choice for the oppressed but to fight with whatever means there are at their disposal. One of the problems that happened for us in Kashmir, in a sense, or, in, or for the Kashmiri struggle, is that. It was many of the adjoining, if Pakistan's role became quite a negative role, because primarily it was not doing something for it, for the Kashmiris, but it, what it regards as its strategic uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the Kashmiri movement is now perhaps rising 
with the ferocity like it's not done in the last 70 years. And I think it's coming off a new dimension. And what I'd like a little bit more focus on is because of the different types of divisions and oppressions within the state of Kashmir mm -hmm. and oppressive forces. So there's the internal ones as well as the external ones. And in a way, the narrative has broken, mm -hmm. if you like. How, do, how have the Palestinians maintained a narrative of after 70 years of being imprisoned, for example, in, in Gaza? The idea that we have a right to return has never been wiped out, notwithstanding the effects, as you know, of the Oslo Accord and all the education mm -hmm. curriculums that got changed as a result of it all. That didn't happen. So how did the Palestinians maintain their, the narrative? And Kashmiris can draw a lesson from that. How can Kashmir maintain a narrative which is at once secular, which is at once dreaming and at once realistic, and they can fight to achieve those things? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, but I don't think that, that we have been able to create a unified narrative. Mm -hmm. There are elements within the liberation movement that want the narrative to be religious. And there are elements of those who support the liberation movement outside of Palestine that also see it as a religious struggle. This is, you know, a, a Muslim struggle for liberation. And it becomes incumbent on those of us that recognize it as a national liberation struggle to make sure that our narrative remains secular, which does not mean atheist, by the way, it means secular. So we need to have a secular national liberation movement, not a religious national liberation movement, because the moment we claim a religious tone, then we are consecrating that this is a fight between Muslims and Jews or Christians and Jews, and it's not. It's a fight between the oppressed and the oppressor. It's a fight between those who are occupied and those who support the occupation. So the narrative becomes key. Now, one of the ways that that, that narrative has been maintained is through song, through literature, through, um, through poetry, through a number of different really key uh, ways. And I would argue that one of our most brilliant leaders is Ghassan Kanafani. And I would encourage people to read his writings, both his writings, his short stories, and also his political analyses of not only literature, but of the movement itself. So this, this is um, a man who was killed in 1972 by the Israeli Mossad, but whose literature continues to be studied in Palestinian camps and amongst you know, Palestinians, not simply in the occupied lands, but you know, throughout the region. And of course, by many of us who support the struggle. So I would look at literary figures like Hassan Kanafani, and of course, on another level, to um, ignore the right of return, to ignore the idea that most of the Palestinians are refugees who have a right to return, and to ask how could they continue to speak of that right 70 years later? I think the way that people do that is because they have to believe. There, there is a line by Eduardo Galeano that I continue to remember, and, and he said that, uh, we have to postpone uh, pessimism to better times. And the way that I read that is that pessimism becomes a luxury of the middle class. Pessimism becomes a luxury for those who feel that it is an option. The people who are truly facing occupation on a daily basis do not have the luxury of pessimism because for them, hope is integral to their survival. And consequently, the call for returning to our towns and our villages and our homes becomes as intrinsic as our ability to breathe and as tied to that inhaling and exhaling. It's very true. It was something I remember reading uh, a line from Ho Chi Minh, that pessimism, Mayusi, as we may call it, pessimism is utterly groundless. You cannot go into a struggle being pessimistic. You have to go into struggle no matter what the odds against you may be yeah. with the sense of hope that no matter what is thrown against us, we can win. It doesn't matter what weaponry they have as long as the narrative is held on. And on that point, for those of our viewers who don't know who Ghassan Kanapani was, we will certainly, I've read much of Ghassan Kanapani and he's been a huge influence of my life. He's made me cry, he's made me angry, bitter, but never without hope. So in a sense, even when some of the stories were a bit depressing in their ending, 
But uh, certainly we will try to encourage uh, JKTV to put some of the stories on associated with this uh, the program so people can download Hassan Kanapani and he's widely available, his work by downloading. I don't know whether it's available in South Asian languages or not, but certainly we can look at that and see if uh, we can move on. Perhaps we move a little bit on because we're running out of time. And uh, this is primarily for you to address people in South Asia, really, or those who don't uh, know uh, what uh, apartheid means. Very often we have an association with Israel and apartheid. Well, I grew up in an anti-apartheid movement, but that was South Africa. What does apartheid mean in the context of Israel? And what lessons, if any, well, let the lessons come themselves. What does it mean in the context of Israel? Well, again, let's go back to narrative. It's being presented by the so-called mainstream media that as if apartheid is a perspective, as if it's an opinion. Apartheid is a crime. And because it's a crime, it has a legal definition. So apartheid, as defined by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, is defined, and I quote, as an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. This is by definition what Zionism is and by definition what the Israeli state has done. So, you know, there, there, there's nothing here to, to argue. The only argument would be whether or not one would support the crime of apartheid as imposed by the Israeli state or oppose it. But there is no legal question as to whether or not the Israeli state is committing the crime of apartheid. Most recently, ESQA, which is a UN agency, published a report just two years ago in which it laid out in very clear terms how Israel has been and continues to be imposing and maintaining an apartheid regime. And it maintains this regime not only against the occupied Palestinians, and I say occupied here by referring to the, the Palestinians in occupied Jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza, where they have a completely different set of laws imposed on them. But Israel also imposes apartheid within what is called the state of Israel against those who have citizenship because Israel separates between nationality and citizenship. So imagine that you can be a citizen and not a national of the state because the full rights of nationals in Israel are legally reserved for so-called Jewish nationals, i.e. so-called Jews. So only Jews can be nationals in Israel. Palestinian citizens of Israel can only have can only have citizenship rights which are not nationality rights or group rights okay which therefore means i know this is confusing for those of us who who have grown up in a system where you are a citizen you are a citizen your your citizenship is not separated if you are a palestinian citizen of israel and and 20% of the citizens of israel are palestinians and these are palestinians that managed to remain in palestine in 1948 they manage not to be militarily removed from their villages or homes, and we can talk about how they manage that. But if you are one of the 20% of these citizens, your right to freedom of movement and residency is curtailed. Your right to family is curtailed. Your right to an adequate standard of living is curtailed. Your right to education, your right to culture, your right to work, and even your right to a home is curtailed because the ethnic cleansing and demolition of Palestinian homes, and again, these are citizens of Israel, has been ongoing since 1948. So we have by definition, through a series of institutionalized laws and regulation, Israel is participating and imposing an apartheid against those who are citizens and those who are occupied in the West Bank and Gaza. And again, this is the legal definition. So without question, there is an apartheid regime by the Israeli state, imposed since 1948. And in a way, learning from the lessons of the anti-apartheid movement of South Africa, one of the great achievements of the pro-Palestinian movement, mm. in particular the, Boyk uh, the BDS movement, mm. 
has been to take lessons from them, as you referred to all these earlier on. Could you perhaps elaborate on how the BDS movement has been working? Because there have been all sorts of very highly emotional